Anyone heard of MCHB before? Oh, okay, quite a number of people. Anyone worked with us before? Awesome, that's good, thank you so much. And I saw Tracy in the room, Tracy is amazing. Where's Tracy again? No, she's gone. Oh, there you are, <laughs> we are. <laughs> so Tracy is also part of us and I'll be introducing the rest of the team in a minute. But before we go ahead, next slide. I just wanted to start with, of course, the 3 6 acknowledgement. So we would like to acknowledge that we're located in Treaty 6 territory, the ancestral and traditional territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Salto, Nakota Sioux, as well as the Métis. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations. We're grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us today and those who have gone before us. Recognize, recognize the land as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on or we're visiting. So we like to say at MCHB, and of course, it's common knowledge that if you're not part of this group, um, you're um, an immigrant to Canada. Um, for me, personally, when I do treaty reconciliations, I'm quite grateful. I'm originally from Nigeria, Western Africa, uh, I came to Canada about 21 years ago, and I am super grateful to be raising two amazing humans on this land. It's a gift I do not take for granted, and I will forever be, every day, walk and do acts of, not reconciliation, but purposeful reconciliation reconcil is what I like to say, in every way, in every day of my life, just because I have been gifted so much on this la land as well. Okay, just setting the mood for today. Um, when we see this, it's always important for us when we present for us to know that we'll be challenging our perspectives a little bit. We're gonna be going a little bit further than what we did this morning. I kind of say thank you so much. This morning it was like the, kind of like an overview. Welcome into an EDI world. And now we're the case study, right? Newcomers, immigrants, and refugees are often seen as different. So what does that mean, right? For you to be seen as different and sometimes you don't feel like you're included or you fit in. So we're kind of honing it in through that, through that lens this afternoon for you. So sometimes when somebody sees a boat, somebody else sees land, and when somebody else sees land, someone else sees boat. Whatever you see today, we're all just trying to have the same conversation. Sometimes we're just coming at it from different perspectives, okay? So that's just some grounding for us. So MCHB, who are we? What do we do? Um, so MCHB is about 25 years old. Started, um, next slide please. Yes, uh, 25 years ago by a group of women who were serving their community. Women are always pioneers, eh? And, um, and uh, our current executive director, Yvonne Chu, um, was one of those phenomenal, amazing women who started this organization. 25 years later, we've grown uh, so many different programs that we do. Anyone from Children's Services here? No? Okay. They're our biggest partner, I think, out of Fort Saskatchewan. <laughs> we work lots with the Children's Services uh, um, sector, and my, my colleague here is going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, but we've grown to a hundred, about 140 cultural brokers working within 40 plus cultural communities in Edmonton and environs. So I also started at some point as a cultural broker, working with English speaking and specifically Nigerian families. Um, a little bit about my background as well. At this point, I realized I didn't introduce myself. So I've been doing this work for a long time. I've been doing this work for about 17 plus years. I'm gonna age myself now. <laughs> um, I started frontline. I started doing this work frontline. I have worked in almost every sector across the social service field. And I went from frontline to executive director. And now I just wear the hat of consultant. So I was an executive director of a non-small, non-grassroots, non-profit organization in Edmonton, and now I'm just a consultant. Um, so that's who we are, and we serve over 3,500 um, families annually, newcomer families, and my colleagues will touch on some of that in a minute as well. So the story of Canada's diversity, just hold on. 
Um, who's a first generation immigrant in the room? First generation. So you came here by yourself, on your own, maybe from so another country. Who? Can you please indulge me and just stand for a minute? If you can, if you're able. First generation immigrants. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's not an easy road. It's not an easy road to travel, but, and somewhat trailblazers do that. Who's a second generation immigrant? Second generation. So one or both parents were born outside of Canada. One or both parents. Perfect. Thank you. You're the in-between people. <laughs> Thank you so much. Who's third generation? Third generation. Perfect. Thank you. Now people, thank you. People know their histories. This is amazing. Histories, stories are important. Fourth generation? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right? These are the building blocks of Canada. Thank you so much. There go fifth generation. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All of us like I said before, are immigrants. And it's always good to know your story. If you don't know your story, I pause here and just ask you to, to find out what that story, what that journey was like or, or is for your family. Very important, okay? So, as a people, oh my goodness, I'm stuck here. The story of Canada. We need to view Canada as a country based on the displacement of indigenous peoples, alongside intentional recruitment of white English and European peoples to create a specific population and cultural traditions. This is our history. I challenged us to, talk, to learn about our own history, but as Canada, that is our history. Let us not forget that, okay? So, who is coming to Canada? When we talk about, oh, immigrants are coming to Canada, who is coming to Canada? And um, I love stats, I love data. <laughs> uh, it's a little bit hard to read, but I can share this with anyone who wants, and there's a whole lot of story behind this, this chat. So who's coming to Canada? This is uh, putting the 2021 and 2016 statistics side by side. So in 20, 2016, Stats Canada, this is all Stats Canada, and um, whenever I use Stats Canada information or data, I just always like to put a caveat because we know not everyone feels the census, okay, for so many different reasons. That's a place we're still trying to work very hard on. First reason, it's always done in English or French. And there's a large population of Canada, we'll see in a minute, that don't speak English or French. Okay, so let's always just remember that when we're looking at Stats Data, Stats Canada Data. And they're working very hard on it. I have to give them that. So, um, can you go back? You one? Yes, please. So, 10 more seconds. So, in 2016, 2020, uh, 20, 2021 stats um, census, India is the number one country, Philippines, China, oh. Syria. <laughs> Who's from India? <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. No worries. It's changed though. It's changed. It's always changed up and down. Um, China, Syria, Nigeria, um, and then you see the list and, and it goes on and on. And in 2016, 2021, we started to see a huge shift. Uh, for those of you who keep, uh, keep up with these trends, a lot of the countries in the top 10 coming to Canada are no longer heavily um, European countries. I don't know if folks are noticing that. And a lot of them, English or French, may or may not be their first language. So our demographics are really, really shifting. Anyone, any surprises on this? Any surprises on the top 10 country? Any? Who's from the United States here? Anyone come from the United States? Anyone surprised to see the U.S. on this map? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry? Yeah. yeah, we're always surprised to see they've been religiously on the top 10 for quite some time now. Any guesses why someone in the U.S. <laughs> would want to come to Canada? <laughs> there I ask. <laughs> 
you know what, I'm just going to leave that alone because that's a whole one hour conversation. <laughs> well, you can ask me later. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. And I know this is quite small, but um, it's good for us to know 4.6 million Canadians speak a language other than English or French, which is our, and this is 2021, it's, it's grown. So this is uh, data stats now because we're in 2024. But when we look at Edmonton, Edmonton is, I would say, yellowish. The top, um, of course, language spoken in Edmonton is Punjabi. Of course, and that flows to the rural areas as well. So just so you know, um, one in four or nine million Canadians had a mother tongue other than English or French as well. No more immigrants, question, right? So there's a belief by a small but very vocal minority of people who believe that limiting or banning immigration to Canada will result in more money being available for people already living here will solve our current housing uh, crisis, and will also make more jobs available to Canadians. Right? There's that very loud, loud narrative right now. But is this true? Let's find out. So the Conference Board of Canada, this is their stats, not mine, um, states that uh, 25% of Canada's population will be over 65 by 2035. What that means is, right now, five, that, what that means is 5 million Canadians are set to retire in about 10 years. When this came out, 2035 was like, oh yeah, we still got time. We only got 10 years. Right now, Every, for every, the Canada, Canada's worker to retiree ratio today is four to one. By 2035, in 10 years, it's gonna be two to one. We can keep up, right? So, um, Canada will need about 350,000 people, immigrants actually, to uh, meet its workforce needs in 10 years. 100% of Canada's population growth will be by immigration in 10 years. And this is all, the, the conference board is talking about, you know, economics and being competitive on a global scale, right? For us to be proud Canadians and still fly our flags in, especially locally, internally, but especially on the international scale, this is what we will need. Next slide. Canada is already at a point whereby it's almost, almost all of its uh, workforce, labor force is de dependent on immigration. So between 2011 and 2016, Canada added uh, over 900,000 workers to its labor force, 90% of whom were immigrants. On two recent occasions, in 2014 and 2016, immigration accounted for 100% of the labor, for labor force growth. So as a country, historically, think about our history, we have always depended on immigration for our economics, for labor, for workforce, for our population. When we look at our landmass, and also some sense we're not having, like many other developed countries, we're not having children quite fast enough. Right? So that's the reality of Canada. Next slide, please. I'm just trying to go very quickly. And we talked about, just very quickly, I also wanted to talk about how people, well, we always hear immigrants, newcomers, refugees, how are people coming to Canada? How people come to Canada depends on how they could possibly integrate as well. We have Northwest here. Northwest deals with a lot of international students as well. So how international students come to Canada will be quite different from how a uh, temporary foreign worker. I know there's some people from industry here. A lot of rural or better industries, you know, hire a lot of temporary foreign workers. So those have different impacts on folks as well. So understanding how somebody's journey to Canada, 
is very important. It's part of their story. So if you don't know a question to ask, ask people. They're always so dying to tell you how they got here, how they came here, what their story is. It's always a very important part of their story as well. So I'm not going to dive deep into this. This is a whole, like I said, another workshop. But it's important. Ask people. Ask them. OK, next slide. Of course, there's always push and pull factors. Uh, is migration ever an active choice? Whether people are pulled to come here or they are pushed to come here, is it ever an active choice? Right? So it's important for us to know that. So push factor sometimes is unstable economic conditions, political turmoil, including war, environmental disasters. And we're seeing more of those as well. You know, our hearts and prayers go out to folks in Florida right now. We keep seeing those things happening in different regions of the world. And now we're getting more and more environmental refugees as well. Push factors that make people come here, economic better employment, um, social better education, services and quality of life as well. Next slide. <laughs> and of course, the migration journey is always different for everybody. Just because you see folks who are temporary foreign workers doesn't necessarily mean their story and their journey is always the same. Again, for refugees, it's always a little bit bumpier. Sometimes people, for you to be, a, you can never be a refugee in your own country. I don't know if folks know that. You have to go to a different country to be given that UNHCR certificate as a refugee. So that means that at least people who come here as refugees have relocated at least to one, one, at least one before they come to Canada. But for some folks, it's multiple relocations and multiple places that they have been before they come to Canada. And of course, there's disruption in healthcare, education, and things like that. And for some folks, voluntary migrants, we just come from our home country here. I like to say sometimes uh, we think often that um, refugees have post-migration traumas. A lot of um, economic voluntary migrants who come here have post-migration stressors because life is not always what it was promised, mm -hmm. right? So we, you, you have the stressor of finding a home, finding employment, and those stressors, if not managed properly, can lead to certain traumas or reignite certain traumas that people have had before. So just something for us to note as well. So the fun part now, <laughs> we're going into the cultural context. Like I said, um, just go to the slide that has their names, if you don't mind. Um, there's different layers to um, the immigrant story, the immigrant journey while in Canada and before they come. Um, I have, I can talk all day ab about this, but I have my three amazing colleagues who are gonna be talking about it um, from different cultural perspectives. They're part of the community as well, so they're gonna be also talking about their own lived experience, and that's why I call them living libraries. I just have a few questions for them, and then I'll open it up to everyone to ask questions as well, and um, they'll share a few nuggets about the work they do and who they are and their story as well. So um, I have um, the pleasure of working and we'll be talking on in and out of these different layers um, as I ask them questions. It's a framework, a model that was designed by MCHP, so they'll be talking in and out of these different layers. And if there's something about a particular layer you want to know more, they're here as well. They can answer those questions as they speak. So I have Gloria. Gloria is right here. She's going to introduce herself in a minute. Gloria works with the English-speaking uh, African co families and communities, but she also works specifically with Nigerian families as well. I have Hina in the middle. Hina uh, works with the South Asian community, and um, I also have Hildi. Hildi works with the Filipino community as well. Okay, um, I, I, I'll just ask that, do you have the mic? Okay, awesome. So Hildi, maybe you want to start, maybe introduce yourself to everyone. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Hildi. I work as a perinatal broker with the Filipino community, and I also started a uh, Filipino youth initiative because we found that as families migrate to Canada, the youth, the Filipino youth, they forget their own culture. So we started up a youth group to introduce to them 
that living a life in Canada does not mean that you forget who you are from back home, because it's important to bring that culture with you. Um, the perinatal program, so uh, anytime there's a pregnant mom, whether it's a complex case or a straight up just pregnant mom who needs support, they come to us. Thank you, and I will pass it on to Hina. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hina Sayed, and I'm from South Asian uh, community. When I say South Asian, it means it is it covers a, a big region: India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Mal Maldives. So it is a big region. We are very diverse uh, community. When I talk about my community, I am just sharing my own experiences. It's nothing. I'm not a spokesperson for my community, but because it, the community is very diverse. As I mentioned, the, the, all three countries, they, have, they speak different languages, they have different culture, they have different the way they look, the way they dress up. So I'm going to talk more about it later. And my role at the co-op is I mostly work with uh, families who are in, uh, I don't know what's the right word, trap or I don't know, with, uh, with children's services or they are kind of, they get involved with children's services, so I help them navigate the system, kind of work in the middle space, working for the family and for the system, and how can they come in the middle space so that the family can live their life independently and enjoy their culture. That's me, thank you. Hello, good afternoon everyone. My name is Gloria Adeakani. I'm a cultural broker for NCHB, I represent the um, African community, which include Nigeria, because I'm from Nigeria, and then every other um, African community that has the need to need a broker. The work of a broker primarily is to mediate between the system and the families that have issues either with children's services or they are trying to assess the um, services in the community and uh, immigration problems and every other issues that immigrants might be facing in this, uh, um, in this new country that they are. Uh, like she said, from whatever discussion we are going to be having, we will be speaking from our experience based on the work that we do. It's not like we are speaking for our various communities. Uh, back home, I came from Nigeria, and before I came to Canada, I was a lawyer. I work with the government as um, a legal officer, and coming here is a different story, and that is most of the challenges that we face as immigrants coming to a different country. So we expand more as they our session go on. Thank you. So, can you please provide uh, an overview, a deeper overview of your community? Um, what languages do they speak? What are the some of the pathways in which um, your communities, uh, community members, come to Canada? Um, how, how many are they now? Better? Like, how big is your community? And what groups do they include as well? In Nigeria alone, we speak different languages. And to talk of other African communities that we represent. So um, I would say they have the Yorubas, the Igbos, the Hausa, the Edos, and so many. We are very diverse. And we, when it comes to language, they are different languages. So we just come together and speak what we call the Pidgin English. That is what everybody understands. That is the common language that we speak. In the process of immigration, they come in various ways. Some come as refugees. Some come as just migrating, leaving their country, looking for a better future for either themselves or their families. Some come as uh, PRO holders. They apply to come here and they have the permanent residency before they come here. But at the end of it all, we are all immigrants. We are coming into a new space to start our life all over. And uh, in Edmonton here, I would say we are like 4%, the black community. But when you come to um, 
breaking it down, that is further broken down into the various countries that we are from, that's 4%. So you see that it's not really, we are not too much um, in that aspect here. So is there anything I'm forgetting? No, no, no. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Gloria. So I know I'm not representing African community, but I work with children's services and all the agencies. Like I still get a call from the police, from children's services, from other agency, asking that uh, we need help for a family, black family. They are from Africa. Africa is a huge continent. It has 54 countries, right? So calling us and letting us, letting, asking us for support for our black family does not mean anything. As Gloria said, it's a huge, com it's a, it has 54 countries. So we, we need to know what part of Africa, what, what place and what language. Anyway, sorry, <laughs> this was small. Because I get that all the time. If the referrals just say family is black. Doesn't say anything. Anyway, so <laughs> when we talk about South Asian community, as I say, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, we are very diverse. The three main big languages are Urdu, Punjabi, and Hindi that we speak. And there are three uh, most dominant uh, religion also, uh, Muslim, Islam, uh, Hinduism, and Sikhism. Our community is guided, and our lives are revolve, they revolve around our uh, faith-based faith. We do most of the practices we do in our lives and in our day-to-day uh, -day life is faith-based practices. Right, so it is very important when we are dealing with a, a, a family from South Asia, we need to know the exact culture. Not every brown person is from India, not every brown person is from Pakistan. So we need to ask them, are you from India, Pakistan? And what part of India or Pakistan? What language do you speak? What faith do you follow? Because as I said, uh, faith drives our lives. Uh, uh, when, you, when you see a woman wearing this, this is called hijab. And that tells you that she is a Muslim woman. But then, not every Muslim woman wears a hijab. So if a Muslim woman is not wearing a hijab, that does not mean that she's not Muslim. She's still Muslim, but she's choosing not to wear a hijab. And for the Sikh community also, you must have seen men wearing turbans. So that is for sure a Sikh men, but that does not mean that if a Sikh man is not wearing a turban, he's not Sikh. Right, so the, every community, every family, every person is so different because it is so diverse. So it is very important for us, as Funke said, that we have to know those persons, ask, ask this question. For our uh, pro um, Alberta province, 11.5% of the total population, we are South Asian. So it's growing quite fast and a lot of uh, immigrants are coming to Canada. The pathways that we have for immigration are mostly economic path pathways, family sponsorship, and work permit. There are very less refugee from uh, our region, and, uh, but I'm seeing that a lot of students are also coming uh, these days because it's a lot of opportunity, but now the immigration uh, is as a halt in that and the student visas are also not happening. So that has impacted our community lots. Thank you. Thank you. For the Filipino community, we have over 200,000 all over Alberta. And 78% of that are staying in the big cities, meaning uh, Edmonton and Calgary. And the rest are in smaller cities, the rural areas. So they are accessing less supports than we would like to know. Um, the Filipinos are we're mostly Roman Catholics, uh, but we, there are also Protestants, and uh, Christianism is also practiced in the Philippines. And um, in, okay, you have to understand that the Philippines is an island. We have 7,107 islands, and within those 7,000 islands, there's about over 1,000 smaller dialects spoken within those islands. But, uh, English, thankfully, is a language that's taught in school and they're used in the government. So we are used to speaking English, broken as it may be, we still speak and understand English. Um, the Filipinos mostly came to, um, historically we started off as live-in caregivers. 
when um, that pathway was opened, the Filipinos came to Canada as live-in caregivers, and then the temporary foreign worker program, for um, which is actually how I came about to Canada in 2008. Uh, it was for lower wage, um, low salary industry. So most Filipinos in Alberta work for the sales and retail industry, meaning restaurants, retail stores. Um, Education in the Philippines is quite high. We value education and close-knit family, but uh, for most of us, there's, there's not much life. We're still a third world country, so we venture out of the country for a better life, and that's just the truth of it. I'm from Nigeria, we speak English. My ancestry is Yoruba. So if you see an immigrant, for those of us who speak English, it means oftentimes we're colonized by the British. So that's something else for folks to know. And for those who are Francophone, uh, they were colonized either by the French or multiple colonizers. Something else for us to know that that is how we, for some of us, that have these multiple dialects uh, or ethnicities, we all come about speaking certain languages. It's because through colonization, it's colonial influences that get us there. Okay, so I have some questions, but I just wanted to check in, in the interest of time, to see if any folks in the audience had questions for us. Anyone? Yes, Tracy. <laughs> so I, after working with you guys for 20 years, I've never thought about this before, but being in this space, this morning we were talking about unconscious bias, and I feel like the brokering practice, this middle space, is largely about unconscious bias in both directions. I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about what you see in terms of the stereotypes and the assumptions that the systems make about your clients and that your clients make about the systems that maybe they're not aware of until you come, you come and support them. That's an amazing question. You know what? I'm going to hand it over to Hina because most days Hina is always sitting between the family and children's services. So if we uh, talk uh, generally, uh, when we uh, when we talk about our communities, if uh, for example, I'm going to be very open and honest when we talk about hiring a Muslim uh, Muslim uh, people, uh, there's a bias that uh, they are whatever, they are terrorists and whatnot, right? So this is one of the biases that we face. And then when we go in home with children's services, they have a pre-assumed pre idea that it's a male dominant home. And the husband uh, is, uh, t take, uh, is a lot of power in the home. The husband makes all the decisions. How and, the, and then when the mother-in-laws are there, the extended family is there, they, are, they overpower the woman. That is true to some extent, but this is also the respect that we, we show towards our elders and we show towards our husbands. And so when, our, when we go into the home, if husband is making all the comments and he's asking all the questions, the, the children's services worker, they pre-assume, they assume that, see, woman is not allowed to speak, woman is not allowed to talk, and woman is not allowed to interject. This is all, this is also, these are all red flags. However, this is, it is not like that. This is just the respect that we give our elders and we give our husbands or our male people that like it or not back home, uh, you know, we women don't work back home. This is not a common thing. We, we came to Canada because we have to meet the needs of our family that because that's why we have to work here and the roles have changed here. But still that does not mean that we leave our cultural values to respect our, uh, our husbands there. So this is one of the biases pre uh, uh, they assume things about our culture. Anything else you want to add for Filipinos? No, I'm not. Yeah? <laughs> no, I just don't want to take it. Yeah. Right? How about you, your community? Yes. Yeah. yeah, you have something to add? Yeah. Yeah, just to add to that, there is also this assumption that um, we, the blacks, we like to like correct our children in a very negative way. One thing I want to put out there is that we were all raised like that, and we came out to be good, though not every one of us. But coming here, you don't expect them to just embrace the culture that they don't know about. They should be given that allowance, that um, opportunity to know how things are being done here. 
the first thing is running into conclusion and thinking that, oh, they don't know how to treat their children. And the thing is, oh, maybe they should be taken away from them. No, but I thank God for we brokers. That is the most thing that we do, the MCHB, is trying to bridge that gap, bringing that understanding to know that, look, this is not how it is. This is what they know, but they are open to learn. At the end of the day, what they want is what is best for their children. So I just want that understanding to be there, that it's not because they can beat their child because they hate them, but they just want them to be the best faction of themselves. Knowing how to do it the right way is learning because they are in a different culture. Thank you. My colleagues really pointed to the, the, the family front, but those are transferable to the workspace as well. I see a lot of newcomers freeze in the offices, in employment, because they're just not sure. They know it, but they freeze, because they're in a new space, new environment. So all, all they really need sometimes is someone to help them. Right? Understand the weather. Oh my God, the weather. <laughs> right? Sometimes, you know, the snow is foreign, right? I'm tropical, right? So coming here, it's getting, it's getting um, colder now. Some people just have traveled through the snow for one hour, very foreign, before they get to the office, right? And then they're trying to navigate things in the office or navigate an interview, right? So just be gentle sometimes and help people along the journeys is very important. Any other questions? Yes, please. I have two. Wow. <laughs> so, well, first of all, it, it, it is just to add to what Hildy said about the Filipino community. Uh, yes, we are immigrating, and this is always a question that I get asked, like why are Filipinos migrating? So one of the things that we need to understand is that the Philippine government spends billions of dollars on labor expert policy. So in the 70s, when there was an unrest and high unemployment, um, the Marcus government created the labor expert policy. So I did have some stats here too. <laughs> so um, right now we have a population of the Philippines is 120 billion. And because of unemployment and unrest, the labor expert policy was created to send an average of 6,000 Filipinos daily to leave the country to work abroad. So um, there's 2.33 billion Filipinos, a million Filipinos working overseas right now and Canada is one of the uh, sought after countries. Um, and, and the government, Philippine government uh, gets 33.5 billion US dollars on remittances alone. So, so the main expert of the Philippine government right now is its people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is the reason why we are in Canada and many other countries. And when you have Canada, you know, who, that has a hunger for cheap labor, we will always have 6,000 people Philippine, from the Philippines leave the country. So that's something that we need to understand. So my question to you is that since we have all of this migration happening, uh, but then there's really no pathway to permanent residence. So how is the government's responsibility on immigration or fixing immigration, are they actually, are we actually a country of welcoming immigrants? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's such a broad question, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you want us to go to wrap up? <laughs> <laughs> That's my wrap up. <laughs> It's like, let's get there. <laughs> well, um, actually, that's what I'm hoping to talk about during the wrap up and during the recommendations. You're absolutely right. It's not just the Philippines. There's a lot of countries that remittance. Anyone knows what we say when we, what we mean when we say remittance? The remittance industry. Okay. You also reminded me of something else. It's a good thing. So a lot of us are immigrants here, migrants, but we still have families back home especially for temporary foreign workers. The temporary foreign workers come here, they're coming here to work. Sometimes they may not be able to come with their family. What that means is that from every paycheck, they remit money back home to grow that economy back home. That's how people pay their rent, buy food, 
my country is also, Nigeria is also another country <laughs> that, that um, remittance is a big, big thing. So a lot of newcomers, you see all of us, but chances are most of us have to send money back home to family, to friends, to relatives. So uh, that is another thing that a lot of immigrants have to deal with that sometimes uh, Canadians do not have to deal with either. So the paycheck is not for the paycheck. I know we're joking and we're chatting over lunch how a bag of grapes is now worth $16. So for some of us, that's a luxury, it's great. But for some folks, they have to divide their paycheck. It's not all theirs. And another myth you just reminded me of as you were speaking is the refugee loan. A lot of people do not know that a lot of refugees pay their way to Canada. Yes. <laughs> they pay back the money. Canada says, hey, we're welcoming 40,000 refugees to, to the country. But the truth is you have to pay back the government of Canada for your airfare and for your medicals and whatever else. <laughs> exactly. It's a myth. Right, that we bring people here. No, Canada loans you the money. Canada loans refugees the money. And if you don't pay fast enough, guess what? They send you to a credit agency. So within, you're just coming to Canada, you haven't even landed your feet. You already have bad credit. So these are some of the things that we don't hear in popular narratives, right? We just hear Canada is bringing people here, but we don't hear the other side. But I came with my husband, with my kids. I'm an economic immigrant. I had the education, but still I had to uh, had twenty-five thousand dollars in my account for me to qualify for immigration. And when you convert that in Pakistani rupees, this is a lot of money. So we had to sell our land, we had to send our home to show the government that we had this kind of money that will help us survive in Canada if we don't end up find, finding the job. So. We have to come with money also when we are coming to Canada for the economic uh, reasons too, right? So the, this, all this money went to Canadian uh, economic in, in the industry. So it's not just refugee, yeah? yeah. Okay, any more questions? Maybe one or two more before we go to wrap up. <laughs> yes. So we have a pilot project with uh, the Siraj project. We have so many projects. We can't list them all there. <laughs> so as brokers, we just kept, we, ju we get pulled into murky situations, like Tracy said, some that we just like, uh oh, right? So there's a Siraj project. So for yeah. victims of crime, uh, we have a project with, uh, in, uh, in collaboration with John Howard Society. Uh, we do advocacy for them, uh, we uh, uh, help them support, connect with resources, flee domestic violence resources, accompany them to the courthouse, help them understand the court system, help uh, them uh, seek uh, legal uh, support and legal advice. So we do work uh, uh, victims of crimes, yes, through, through our one program. That we may be able to support me. Star Star, uh, support organizations in uh, Fort Saskatchewan as well, where is the Rural Multicultural Support Project. So the government of Alberta realized that there's a lot more newcomers moving to rural. Well, definition of rural is 100,000 or less. So I don't know if Fort Saskatchewan is rural enough, but, and they're needing supports, right? Again, housing, everything is pushing um, newcomers further out of Edmonton and Calgary. So that's a pilot project we have as well, so we can chat what that looks like. So we're trying to connect with organizations as well in rural Alberta to see how we can best support newcomer integration. And the hopes is that they stay and they don't say, oh, oh there's no support for us here, and then come back to the big cities. Um, and I found this, I don't, I, I'll, try, I'll, I'll love to, I, you know what, please indulge me to read this. This was this morning because it would really tie into, sorry I don't see your name from here, but to tie into exactly what, what you said. The other way. That way? Yes, right. Wrap up. Ooh, there yeah. we go. <laughs> okay, so I, I saw this, this in an op-ed in Toronto Star this morning. And it talks about our current immigration uh, situation as Canada. Canada is often seen as a land of opportunity for immigrants, offering the chance to build a better life. My partner, Mark, my partner Marco and I 
Both skilled professionals believed in this promise when we moved here. However, restrictive immigration policies and bureaucratic delays are now putting that promise and everything we've worked for at risk. In August 2022, we left Argentina full of hope. I enrolled in a marketing program after six years of working as a pharmacist in the pharmaceutical industry. Marco, who was on was an, on an open work permit, quickly found a stable job as a trade system coordinator at an important health and consumer packaging goods company. But in August, everything changed, so August of this year. His work permit extension was rejected with the explanation that he wasn't contributing to the Canadian economy. An odd reason for someone in a full-time job. The rejection also stated that we could, own, we could reapply if we provided proof of my employment as a primary applicant. His rejection threw our lives into chaos, leaving us questioning how we would manage and whether we had a future in the country we had now called home. I received my postgraduate work permit the next day, but the shock of Marco's rejection remained. Despite submitting over 90 pages of documentation to prove my employment, we are still waiting for his approval. For months now, Marco has been unable to work or leave the country, and the average processing time for work permits is 90 to 120 days, if not longer. Every day we remain in limbo, and the stress of not knowing what the future holds is overwhelming. In the meantime, we face financial and emotional strain as our future hangs in the balance. What happens if his application is denied again? Where would we go? What will become of life? We've, we've been working so hard to build. What will become of life we've been working so hard to build here? Canada depends on skilled immigrants to fill critical roles, yet current policies make it difficult for those already here to maintain their status. The irony is that while sectors across the economy are facing labor shortages, policies are creating barriers for people like us who are willing and qualified to contribute. Marco's inability to work has placed us under significant financial strain. We've lost a large portion of our household income and cost of reapplying and restoring his status, his status continues to rise. Just like Hina said, there's costs to it. Our savings meant for uh, our future are being depleted to cover daily expenses and fees just to navigate this bureaucratic maze. We follow the rules paid our taxes and contributed to the economy, yet we face an uncertain future because of, system, because of a system that feels like a barrier rather than a pathway to success. For skilled workers like us, the stakes are high. One rejected work permit can unravel years of hard work, throwing lives into disarray and discouraging future immigrants from choosing Canada as a place to build their lives. It is weird for me to have to explain this coming from a family of immigrants myself. But skilled immigrants fill crucial gaps in the labor market, bring innovation, fresh perspectives, and support economic growth. Canada's reputation as a welcoming destination for immigrants has long attracted talented professionals who want to contribute to the country's future. But the immigration process is long, expensive, and emotionally draining. We come because we believe in the opportunities Canada promises. However, recent policies suggest that Canada only value immigrants when it is convenient. When things get tough, like when permits are delayed or rejected, we're left hanging. Let's not forget that many essential jobs, whether in healthcare, technology, or service industries, are filled by immigrants. I work in liver healthcare, partnering with organizations to try, trying to eliminate hepatitis by 2030. We see firsthand the conditions of immigrants in, the medical and in medical and community settings. If Canada continues making it difficult for skilled professionals to stay, who will help step in, fill these critical roles. We risk losing a key driver of innovation and economic stability, a call for change. We're not asking for special treatment, just for a fair system that recognizes our contributions and supports those who want to build a life here. Canada's strength lies in its diversity and its ability to attract talent from all over the world. But without reform, the promise of opportunity will fade, and Canada risks pushing away the skilled workers it so desperately needs. The time for change is now. Canada's future depends on welcoming skilled workers, not pushing them out. This was this morning. And if you want to know more, again, um, 
I put it's in the slides, and I, anyone who needs the slides, I'll share them. Oh well, yeah. Amber already has them. Um, going back to what what was shared before, um, Canada is in a very difficult position. This is what we're hearing now. We're seeing a lot of people who are stuck, and and there's no resources to support them. What happened was during COVID, there was a lockdown. Every year, I think in 2019, I still remember 2019, about 5 million people entered Canada, 5 million people. Last year, it was around 4 million. I, I, I checked the stats, but I didn't use them. Um, what happened during COVID was that people were trapped. So some people were visitors, some people were temporary foreign workers, some people were students. We were all here and we were all locked in. And because of the temporary measures, policy, um, uh, public policies that were made, some of those people are still here. So there's people who are trapped in the system, in the immigration system that seems like we have way too many people here. But if some of these things are the residues of COVID that were still effects of COVID that we're still trying to work through as a country. Is the government getting it right? I don't know. It's very complex. Immigration is very complex, but it's having real impact on people's lives every day. Some folks now are just getting like this family, they just get rejected. And because Canada is like, oh, we have too many people here. The system can't take this much people. From COVID, they're trying to put in some corrective measures, right? I still don't have the answers for those corrective measures. If there's anyone here who has them, the reform that we so desperately need, please email RCC, get in touch, let's do a, a think tank or whatever. But these policies are having real tangible impacts on people's lives every day. And we're seeing them also in our work. Some of us are seeing folks that were like, we don't know what to do because of the impacts of these policies. These policies are now becoming seeming like they are not inclusive, I must say. And I, I, I would say this, and you can kill me after. <laughs> I hope this is not for this on the video. <laughs> but I think we're getting to the point in Canada where we'll just have to do an open policy like Senior Trudeau did, where you set some criteria and everybody will have to be accepted. Because there's some people who are stuck here, not because they want to be stuck here, but they find themselves here. Same policies that got them here are now spitting them out. Yeah. It's not just, and when we're talking about inclusive societies and people who are contributing, we have, we have to figure it out together. It's not just an immigrant's problem. It's not just those folks who have come here. They've sold everything to be here. They've given up everything to be here. They deserve a place in society. Okay. What can we do? That's my, my rabbit hole. I'm out of it. <laughs> so the first thing I would say we should do is things like this. We need spaces like this, more spaces like this. Amber, thank you so much. I could never have imagined that it would get to this. Bring everybody together. All of us, come together. Come together. Those of us who serve immigrants, newcomers, refugees, those of us who hire them, right? Those of us who support them, everybody, just everybody. Bring everybody together and have a conversation. This is what we need to do. But some, oftentimes we're in our silos having a conversation and we don't do it together, right? So um, I, I took these recommendations right out of the conference board. They, they just did a research study and they, they this was done in August, so it's still very fresh, and this is what they're coming up with. That is the best way forward, given our current economic situation as well. And when things are tough, when your grocery bill is like $200, $300 over, everyone is, you know, we're all at, on edge. But being on edge is not the solution. It's all coming, us coming together to figure out why, right? And also, more innovative you know, practices in hiring as well, right? Um, a lot of people, um, Especially in First Saskatchewan, you may hire a lot of newcomers, immigrants, temporary foreign workers. By the way, Alberta is the second largest consumer of temporary foreign workers next to Ontario in, in Canada. So we use a lot of temporary foreign workers. I often say, when you drive through Tim Hortons or um, uh, Wendy's or Burger King, chances are it's a temporary foreign worker serving you. So just so you know, we use a lot of temporary foreign workers. But um, let's be creative in our hiring processes as well. The immigration um, situation right now will not change except for advocacy from industry. Industry needs to lend their voice in there as well. So it's very important. 
these uh, the workers you hire also have a life. Some of them are dealing with precarious situations. They don't know if their work permit is going to get extended. Sometimes they need industry as well. And also improving access to information when it comes to immigration processes as well. Let's get curious, don't get furious. Or if you have someone in your office that their work permit is being delayed, just say, okay, you know what, that's not my problem. When you get it, you come back to work. No, that's not how it works, right? So just sometimes improving access to information as well. Um, working with um, immigrant serving organizations, like I said, and also uh, developing resources. When we do uh, hiring and retention as well, what are some of the things we bring into those conversations, right? HR policies, you know, those very amazing policies that we all work within, right? How are you looking at people's pathways, people's immigration, people's stories, people's lives as well? How do they connect in some of those policies um, as industry? So I would leave that here. I will leave it with you, but I just want to remind you as well, you know, the intercultural journey continues. It's always a mindset, it's a heart set, and it's also a skill set as well. Take it with you. Um, it doesn't just stop in this room. My hope, my goal, my all of us from MCHB is that we will continue to walk this road. Um, it's not going to change. Canada needs new, new immigrants. Whether the policies change or not, we need, we need immigrants historically for our workforce, for our population growth. And Canada likes to brag. Canada likes to brag on the international scale. Look at us, we're better than America. We always say that, right? So in order for us to keep bragging, we need immigration. That's just the way it is, and that's the reality. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening to us. I hope it was helpful.